I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are, which, with, with ye are called. Therefore, because of the first three chapters of grace truth, we are called saints, sons of God, heirs of God, seated in Christ in the heavenlies, God's workmanship and habitation where God dwells. We have been reconciled, are in the body of Christ with him as our head, sealed with the Holy Spirit, have access because we are accepted, been redeemed, have total security. We are in him, have been chosen to reveal the manifold wisdom of God or mystery program to man and angels. We've seen that. And we have God who goes beyond what we might ask or pray about. The young boy came out of, I can't think of the guy's name right now, old time preacher. And he preached on security of the believer. And the little boy said, we're sitting pretty good, aren't we? Well, you look at all those things that we've learned in the first three chapters, we're sitting pretty good, aren't we? And uh, therefore, because of these things, therefore looks to the past doctrinal, D-O-C-T-R-I-N-A-L, looks to the past doctrinal statements to look toward the future life of Christ-likeness. Our, out of gratitude, we have a life in accordance to these truths. Paul transitions from our position that he's taught us in the first three chapters to our personal, practical living. In other words, the first three chapters, he deals with doctrine. Now he's going to deal with everyday living the practical lifestyle, okay? Notice what I say there. B, always remember doctrines, body truths, are to be balanced by the believer's conduct. We have seen doctrine become the rallying point in the church. And by the way, we've seen that. Uh, remember the Southern Baptist uh, a lot of the conservative ones like Adrian Rogers and Dr. Stanley and several others, uh, Young and several of them, they fought for inspiration of scriptures. And they won that, but they lost the battle in their schools. But they actually won that battle, okay? But in the process, they neglected the believer's practical everyday living. Or we have seen loose living with very little doctrine. Both of these, when you're just doctrinal or you're non-doctrinal, have cost the church. Focusing only on doctrine has led zealots to become cold and indifferent in personal dealing with others, dealings with others. Then focusing mainly on personal matters, the church became all about them. We have also seen where there is little doctrine taught in churches, it causes loose living. They have little doctrine teaching so their lives cannot be shaped by truth. You know, if you don't have doctrine... What's the basis of your living, your behavior? Well, then you begin to go by, well, what does the church say or what do my friends say? Personal opinions rather than truth. So it's important that we have our doctrine, but also it's important that we have our living that matches that doctrine. Okay? If you just have doctrine, you become cold and impersonal, legalism. And without doctrine, you become loose, anything goes. There's no standard for my way of living. And so both of those are wrong. You have to bring them together and have the balance, don't you? That's very important. And a church that doesn't have doctrine, they have no anchor. You know, Justin's saying the anchor still holds. Well, 
we have to have that anchor we can always fall back on, isn't it? Okay? C. Paul has taught doctrine for three chapters. Now he switches to the believer's conduct, the next three chapters, within the body and within the local church. Immediately we see Paul bringing balance to doctrine and devotion of life. You need both of them. B, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, that should say. The Christian life is not a vacation. <laughs> Amen? It's vocation. <laughs> Wherewith ye are called. Number one, Paul was in prison in Rome. We know that. This was because of the message. He preached the mystery truths for them and the church. You can read those verses sometime later on. Turn to the next page. I'm not going to look at all the verses that I wrote down, just the main ones. B, these truths that Paul taught in the first three chapters, doctrine, the mystery message, is so hated by the devil and those involved in legalism. And by the way, Legalism always hates grace. Legalism is rules, regulations. You have to. And they smother you with that. Anybody ever been there? And so they hate our doctrine of grace. We don't serve him because we have to. You've legislated it. We serve him out of devotion. We love him for such a great salvation that we want to be holy, godly, like Jesus, right? This is because it is special revelation from God explaining how we believers in the age of grace have different beliefs and living instructions. We have several differences. Living under law, living under grace is night and day, isn't it? Standing up for the truth, oh, okay, all previous, cut the word all out, mark that out, I should have caught that, previous past beliefs and conduct, it's not all bad now, and conduct were earthly and under law. Today we are under grace, the heavenly for our beliefs and our lifestyle. Our beliefs, our relationship is a spiritual relationship, whereas Israel's under law was more physical, bring sacrifices, do this, do that, do this, do that. And ours is more of a personal relationship, a spiritual relationship. There, they're thinking about the earth, we're thinking about going to heaven. So there are differences, okay, between them and us. C, standing up for the truth usually always will put enemies at our door. Look down at chapter 23, verse 12 and 13, just to give you an idea. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. I mean, he had people hunting him, wanting to get him alone so nobody could see it, and kill him. That's how much they hated him. They hated his message, what he was saying. Satan, see it where it says Satan? Satan and the enemies of truth hate it that Paul has put believers in a position to know the mind and will of God for this dispensation. He hates it that we separate the body of Christ from the nation of Israel. He wants to keep it all mixed up so he can keep mankind confused. So he can keep mankind trying to work his way 
to a relationship with God, whether it's for salvation or whether it's a relationship, man trying to do this and that and everything. Two, Paul, with heartfelt compassion, he's beseeching them, he's imploring them, not scolding or commanding, is humbly entreating, entreating them to live daily in accordance with their new doctrine. Look what God's done for you, first three chapters. Look what you're a part of and how God wants to work through you, where your position is, and so on. Paul is saying to make our practice match our position in Christ. Our walk is our conduct, behavior, or the whole course of our life. Remember, Enoch, what did he do? Walked with God. We are to have a balanced life. Consistent life of doctrine and behavior. And they go together. We are to have a consistency there, a balance there between those two. It doesn't do you any good how much you know and this and you don't live right. Because when you know this and you live contrary to the way God says this should be, then you are a hypocrite. Isn't that true? Four, or <laughs> Colossians, I'm sorry, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Now notice, being fruitful in every good work, there's our behavior, and increasing in the knowledge of God, there's our doctrine. See that? Both of them. For doctrine is the foundation upon which our walk is based. Our walk is governed, determined by the grace doctrines. We are to practice what we preach. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, there's love, there's my behavior, Number five, understand our calling has been a divine, heavenly call upon our lives. We have, by the way, we have the privilege, the responsibility, the obligation to live up to that calling. Have you ever said, why me? Why has God even saved you? You deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. You didn't have to say that so affirmingly when I said me, okay? <laughs> but I, we all deserve it. Have you ever said, why me? Why in the world did the grace of God touch my heart? Now notice A, it's a high, H-I-G-H, a high calling. That's what the verse says. B, it's a holy calling. That's what the verse says there. And C, it's a, what? Heavenly calling. So it's a high, holy, heavenly calling. What a privilege. Verse 2, with all loneliness and meekness and longsuffering for bearing one another in love. Paul now begins to show us what it actually takes to live a life worthy of our high calling. Our thinking and attitudes must be in alignment with God's truth for the body before our actions will be accepted by God. He's going to give here... Four inner qualities to walk worthy of this high calling that God has on our life. Most people focus on the outside. 
Last week we learned and remind ourselves again, God does his work in us, within us, doesn't he? The inner man, as we saw last week. Okay? Now notice he says there, with all lowliness. One, this means we have humility, a modest mindset of ourselves. In other words, we can't live this grace life if we're full of pride. Okay? Humility is so rare because it is unnatural. <laughs> Only a true believer who is allowing the Holy Spirit to control his life can learn the Word and genuinely practice humility. Humility, by the way, is completely contrary to society. Society, they want you to focus on yourself constantly. And one of the big things psychology does is love yourselves. Christ said, no, there's a little problem. You already love yourselves too much. Huh? Your love ought to be placed in me, not yourself. Two, humility in a believer lessens his thinking about himself and helps him focus on God. His goal is to lift up God and others. Look down at verse, uh, Romans 12, 10 there. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. It's not about us, it's about him, isn't it? Lowliness, three, lowliness, humility, of course, is the opposite of being haughty or prideful. Have you ever seen on TV as many award shows in your life as this last year? They have awards for everything. And they're all focusing, they're all full of themselves. How great we are. Awards, awards, awards. When in reality, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. <laughs> Proverbs 16 Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That ought to be enough. Look down there to Spurgeon. We as Christians have the choice between being humble or being humbled. Amen? I remember the story of this retired general. He had quite a bit of wealth and stuff, British. And uh, he had a big banquet. And this one real sophisticated lady came in, and the aides sat him on the left side of the table. Now, if you know the right side of the table is place of honor. And this sophisticated lady said, does your aide always have problems with sitting their guest, seating their guest? Here's what the general said, if I won't forget this. Oh, no, the general said. Those who matter don't mind, and those who mind don't matter. <laughs> Amen? B, another inner thing, and meekness. One, this has the idea that believers are to have gentleness, mildness, and even kindness. 2 Corinthians, now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You want to be like Christ, you need to have it. Two, so meekness means to be mild-mannered and under control at all times, except when traffic's going in front of me and they drive 10 miles under the speed limit. Now, meekness never means weakness. Meekness never means weakness. Moses was a courageous man, yet it is said of him, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were up on the face of the earth. Can you imagine that? But boy, he was courageous too, wasn't he? So, it pictures a wild horse being tamed under the control of its master. It is the inner man controlled by the Holy Spirit 
within. Strength under control. Even Christ was mild. Look at Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. But yet, Matthew 21 says this, Jesus went into the temple and cast out all them that sowed and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sowed doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now for Christ to do that, even though he was meek, he was very courageous, wasn't he? As the one guy said, when he turned the money changers' tables over and the money started flying everywhere, he, it's a wonder they didn't try to kill him. Somebody said, have you ever tried to separate a Jew from his money? <laughs> then see with long suffering. This has, this has the meaning of patience. It takes a long time to become angry. Unless you're following in traffic and they're 10 miles under the speed limit. Reactions are not to be quick retaliations. Long-suffering is the ability to endure negative circumstances. My wife is great at this. Real truthfully, she is. She just looks at me. I... I I know what she means just when she looks. Negative circumstance, without losing our cool. In other words, they're long-fused. Two, the long-suffering of the believer is acceptance of whatever God's plan for them might be. But it's never God's plan for one to go 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. There is to be no questioning, grumbling, or losing of temper. Yeah, pastor, pray for me. I, my, 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 always my fear is when I pass them on Whiteland Road coming to church, they pull into the driveway. <laughs> They're visitors coming in. D, forbearing one another in love. You know, in life... You're always going to have times where you're hurt, there's misunderstandings, there's disagreements. I mean, you're going to have that in life. But notice this, what this means. One, love encourages us to put up with everything that is disagreeable in others, even their weaknesses. Peter says, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity or love shall cover the multitude of sins. We are never to cover up or make excuses for people's sins, but are to keep their sins from becoming any more known than necessary. Forbearing love takes abuse from others while continuing to love. Like Bev does Bob. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 12. Hate, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth how many sins? All sins. I wrote this beside that. Believers are to understand their own faults and failures to make them hesitant to condemn anybody else. Notice my note. Now put lowliness, meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing in love, within the context of the mystery truths that we who believe in them practice. Now notice what I say about this. Why do you think it is so important that we walk worthy of our vocation? Do you think God knew of the opposition that mystery believers would face from the enemy and even our brethren 
and family. There's a reason God wants us to live with these qualities. And notice what I go on to say here. Do we believe God knows best what our testimony should be to hinder their attack, convince the gainsayers, and glorify God in the heavenlies? Not only is it equally important to share truth with others, friends, family, whatever, but it's equally as important that our practice of these inner qualities helps us when we share it or when they don't respond in a positive way toward us. If we keep the right type of inner qualities, a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, we can say to him, man, you're a heretic. <laughs> you got it all wrong. You're a mess. You need to get here rightly dividing, boy, where it's at. Rather than having these four good qualities so they're not turned off. So I think Paul is giving us, he's given us doctrine but though we have the truth, it's important how we live the truth, practice the truth, so that we not hinder the truth. Make sense? Oh, I've had people come to me after service, visit, and say, hey, you're wrong there, bro, 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 bro. That's first. I said, did I say anything correct? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Verse 4. Now we get into the ones here. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. Oh! Oh, I got to go all the way up, don't I? Verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. And by the way, you can't keep the unity of the spirit if these qualities aren't in you. You're not the right one to keep the unity then. <laughs> okay? A, it is our responsibility to guard, preserve, strive to protect, and to maintain. To maintain the oneness of the Spirit. One, Paul is not telling us to produce unity, but to keep, preserve the unity that the Holy Spirit has produced already with the mystery truth for today's church. Let me say something to you. By rightly dividing does away with so much of the confusion that people take verses out of context that's meant for somebody else. So it's, we don't have to produce this. It's already provided for us through the Holy Spirit, writing of the scriptures, and so on. Okay? Now, it's our responsibility to try to preserve this unity so there be less confusion. <clears throat> Notice too, unity is based upon correct biblical dispensational knowledge. Literally approaching the word of God and obeying it exactly in its literal meaning. In other words, we believe what the scripture says. It means what it says. I've told you about the one guy said to me, I showed him a verse. He said, I see it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> B, the Spirit places believers into the body of Christ where all distinctions are lost. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, right? Where all are one. In Christ, thus producing peace. The believers have the responsibility to work at maintaining this unity. We have the Holy Spirit in us to help us to attempt to preserve peace 
within the body of Christ. A singleness, a singleness in purpose and in belief. I wrote down a long time ago how the devil attacks. And the devil attacks one, it's not on your sheet, he attacks one through discouragement. He did this, to, all these are, he did this to Nehemiah and he tries to do it in our life. He tries to attack us through discouragement to take away our hope. He attacks us through division to create schisms and separate believers so that they will oppose one another. He attacks through diversion. He tries to get us off course, to get us sidetracked. Remember in Galatians 5, 7, you got that verse, Kelly? Galatians 5, 7, I think it's a good verse. Want a piece of candy? <laughs> you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Somebody's gotten you off course. And the devil's good at it. Pull up Romans 15, 6. So he attacks through discouragement, division, diversion, and then criticism. You didn't run well. Who did hinder you that you, yeah, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be one, but he has the ability to cause criticism, to get Christians to murmur, to murmur about this and to murmur about that and always negative and always complaining. And Don't you just hate being around people like that? Just pulls you down, doesn't it? That's what the problem with Israel was, okay? But well, the devil's very good at that. Verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. True unity does not mean that we lay aside our doctrine... But instead, it means holding to the same basic doctrines as the foundational teachings of the church today. Notice he said, fulfill ye my joy and be ye like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So when we talk about unity... We're not talking about ecumenicalism where just drop your doctrine and you all become one and love Jesus. Uh-uh. He's not talking about that. Like Pope says to the, in Turkey, he's in Turkey, he was yesterday, and he says we need to get more together and so on and everything like that. <laughs> you got head choppers over here and you wanted to... Have, B, here Paul begins to present a brief statement of the faith, the body of truth. The seven spiritual, underline, circle that word spiritual. The seven spiritual unities of the faith. These doctrines make up a bare minimum of truth which need to be held in order to have true unity among believers. I was down in Flapjacks the other day, and, and a guy, he, 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 he speaks at pastor's little church down in Columbus, and he says, well, you know, it's not about what church you go to, what you believe and all that. You know, we just love Jesus, want people to see people come to Christ. And I'm listening to him, and I'm thinking to myself, you don't get it, do you? Your unity is based upon your doctrine, your teaching. Number one, it says there's one body. Or am I wrong there? Yeah, there's one body. One, there are not two bodies. 
Some people believe the church started after Acts 28 and that there was a body before Acts 28 that was a different one, but the real body, Paul's body, begins after Acts 28. And it's just crazy. There are not 20 bodies. Paul has in mind the spiritual body of Christ. Look down at Romans 12, 5 at the bottom of the page. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Page 6. Now I'm going to go fast. There is one body. This one body, I should say, is also referred to as the church. The one body, the church, the universal church. Some people don't like to use that word, but that's what you call it. It's universal in the sense that anybody who's saved all around the world are part of this universal church, the body of Christ. You can look at Ephesians there. Colossians, see that? Notice the last phrase of Colossians 1.24. For his body's sake, which is the, what? Church. Three, this is the spiritual body that consists of all believers in this dispensation. From Acts 9 on to us, it's been 2,000 plus years now. When one puts his faith in the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, he is placed, he is placed into the body of Christ by the baptizing work, not water, the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit, spirit baptism. Then he says there is one spirit. This, of course, is the third person in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Paul refers to the dispensation of grace in how indispensable, in how indispensable the spirit is in the church body age. Here's just a few things the Spirit is involved in today in the age of grace. A, he renews. He renews, regenerates us. Last part of that verse, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. B, he helps us make Christ and proclaim Christ Lord. Notice the last part of that verse. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, he seals us, S-E-A-L-S. -E he seals us with himself. Last part of that verse. In whom also after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. D, he guarantees our future. Talking about the Spirit, which the Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption. He's the down payment, the earnest, the down payment, guaranteeing the rest of the payments on its way because God says it's going to happen. E, he assures us that we are children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are. You ever speak to your heart, by the way? F, he helps us when we pray. Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot, we don't even know how to pray right. G, he illuminates. He illuminates our understanding of truth. You're trying to figure this out, and all of a sudden the lights come on. That ever happened to you? Of course. How did that happen? The Spirit of God who lives in you illuminates your mind and He makes that verse come alive and clear to you. Ah, I see that. Uh, Kelly, pull up uh, 1 Timothy 1.15 for me. And then Romans 15.8. Yes, 1 Timothy 1.15. And then Romans 15, 8 for me, if you would. I was just thinking of him. Kenny? 
Can he? That's it. They're talking up there. Look at it. I was going to just say, why don't you help that blonde up there? Why don't you? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I looked over here. She got blonde hair. Blonde. I go, I'm in trouble. Now, uh, that's not the one I wanted. Try verse 16 then. Yeah, verse 16. Huh? Well, there, okay. Now, how many times have you ever read this verse? How bid for this cause I obtain mercy that in me f first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Paul was first in the body of Christ, people. When was Paul saved? Acts 9. And he is the pattern of grace today. If anybody didn't deserve it, Paul didn't, did he? But he showed what the body of Christ, the age of grace, is all about. Grace. He's the pattern. How many have read Romans 15, 8? Boy, in your old age, you're getting slow, Kelly. <laughs> now, I say... <laughs> That Jesus Christ was a minister of the, and what was he doing? For the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the, who's the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the covenants, Moses. You know, when he was on the earth, he dealt with Israel. How many times I just go in and take Israel's promises out and just bam, no big deal. But when you begin to rightly divide those verses all of a sudden, boy, the Spirit of God begins to say, hey, Dodo, do you see this? <laughs> hey, man, has that ever happened to you? Say, oh, there it is. <laughs> he has to me. Where am I? H, he helps us. I'm just going to give you the words. He helps us, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, live for Christ. Well, I'm going to read it. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Walk in the Spirit. J, he develops godliness within us. And then J, A, what? Yeah. He reveals by his presence if we are saved or not. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, what? If you don't have the spirit of God, you're not saved. You're none of his. But if you have the spirit of God, that's telling you, you are saved. Okay? Did you notice what the Spirit of God does? There's one Spirit. Did you notice what it does not say? Did you notice that I said what? what how do I want to say that? You ever get tongue-tied? Never, never notice it, yeah. What he doesn't say, the Spirit of God does. What? Signs, wonders. Miraculous. No, that's not the way he operates today. Now, God can do whatever he wants to do. I understand that. When he wants to touch somebody, he can. He has. But within the framework, he's not dealing with Israel, so he's not dealing with signs and wonders today. Okay? Uh, e, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, at one, remember... That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And when we were that way, before the body of Christ began, having what? No hope and without God in the world. That's the way we were. 
an act of God's grace has given us hope. Amen? Two, this word hope has several aspects, yet it is all part of one hope. Hope biblically means God's truth that we can rest upon. It means that we, with expectation, and why not, God cannot lie, and certainty know what God's Word says is true. So here's our hope. A, hope is found in the Scriptures. Boy, I can read that. I don't care what the world says. I can read that. The world can't take my hope away. My hope's there in what God says. B, hope is in our salvation. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. C, hope is in God. Now the God of hope. That's why it just, just kills me. Everybody, they're given their analysts, you know, they're given their theories and their viewpoints and the psychologists come on and then the experts come on and all them, and they're just passing on human personal opinion. If you want to know the truth, we need to hear from God. D, hope is the rapture. In the middle of that verse it says, that you saw or not, even as others which have no hope. We do have hope, don't we? We're going up. E, hope is in Christ. Jesus Christ, which is our hope. About done. Last page. Some of you can wake up now. Come on. F, hope is looking for Christ's return. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. G, hope is the climax of the ultimate end of God's purpose for us. What is God's purpose for us? Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. One day we're going to be glorified. That's the ultimate end. One day over here, we'll be glorified. Amen? Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, pull up verse 4, uh, let me see, yeah, uh, verse 5, Kelly, for me, if you would. One Lord, one faith, one, okay. Now next week, we'll get into the baptism deal again, Okay. And I keep having people ask questions and so on like that. So next week we'll get down to the nitty gritty of why today it's not water baptism, but it's spirit baptism. And that is of utmost importance. Amen?